Hello everyone and welcome to the 24th edition of the BioExcel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov and I will be today's host. At the today's presentation, we will have a look at one of the most popular force fields for coarse grain simulations, the Martini force field, which will be presented by the lead developer of the force field, Sivertian Marin. Before we start, I have to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and after that we will upload it to the BioXL's YouTube channel so that you can look at it at your convenience or share it with uh, colleagues or friends. This webinar series are organized by BioXL, Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research and I'd like to give you a, a short overview of our activities in case you're not familiar with them already. BioXL has been running for several years as one of the European Centers of Excellence and we work with several key applications for molecular dynamic simulations such as Chromax, for integrative modeling, Haddock and for hybrid QMMM modeling. Uh, CPMD and we work on improving their performance, efficiency and scalability. We also work a lot on usability aspects of these applications by devising efficient workflows and coupling them with uh, the necessary data, data integration systems. We work with uh, very popular platforms such as Galaxy, Knaim, Apache Taverna, Comces, Open Facts. BioXL also provides uh, plenty of services in uh, training and consultancies where we promote best practices for usage of the applications and making the best use of high performance computing and high throughput computing resources. Within the center, we, we run a number of interest groups that some of you might be interested in joining. The interest groups cover several different aspects of the broad field of computational biomolecular research, such as uh, integrative modeling, free energy calculations, workflows. We have an interest group uh, specifically looking at uh, practical applications for industrial users. So if uh, any of those are appealing to you, please visit our website and uh, subscribe to, to them. We also have support forums and a chat channel that uh, we encourage you to use if you have uh, any questions or you would like to get in touch with us. At the end of today's presentation we will have a questions and answers session where you will be able to ask your questions to Sivertian. For that, during the presentation at any time, feel free to use the questions tab in the control, it will go to webinar control panel and when we start the actual Q&A session I will give you the microphone and let you speak directly with uh, Sivertian and ask your question. If you don't have a microphone or we have problems with the audio then I will read the question on your behalf. And of course you are always welcome to join us for discussion at uh, our forums at ask.bioexcel.eu. And it's my pleasure to present you today's speaker, Sivar Jan Maring from University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Sivar Jan uh, received his PhD in molecular dynamics simulations in 1994 and he did several postdoctoral research works in Germany and Australia. And since 2005, he is a full professor and he's heading the research group in molecular dynamics at the University of Groningen. It's one of the universities with uh, very big contributions to the field of ND simulations. Sivriank is also a director of the Berenson Center for Multiscale Modeling in the same universities. Uh, his interests are on multiscale modeling and especially looking at the organizational principles of cell membranes. 
Uh, many of you know him as the uh, lead developer of the very popular Martini force field, uh, about which we will hear in more details today. So I would like to say uh, welcome to Sivertian, and I will now give him the opportunity to present. Okay, good afternoon everybody. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. And well, I assume for some of you it will be a good afternoon. Others might be in the morning session or even uh, in the middle of the night. For me, it's uh, three o'clock uh, in the afternoon, uh, sunny weather. And I'm happy to talk to you about uh, the Martini force field that we have been developing in our lab over the past years. So to all get on the same footing, I will uh, first talk uh, about a little bit martini basics, how to prepare actually a perfect martini. In general, the martini cocktail combines gin and vermouth at a ratio of two to one, and you mix it together with ice cubes and garnish with an olive. Of course, there's a lot of varieties that you can, uh, you can try. There's the dry martini made with dry gin, the martini rosso with red vermouth, the vodka martini, where you stir in vodka instead of gin, and the perfect martini using, using equal amounts of sweet and dry vermouth. And of course, if you're not so much into alcohol, you can go for a Zen martini with no gin and no vermouth either. Of course, there's always people skeptic about martini. They say that just filling a glass with gin, waving it in the general direction of Italy, should be enough to call it a martini. Okay. Let's go to the more serious stuff of this webinar. Uh, this is the outline of the webinar. I will first uh, talk about the looks of the Martini model, and then I will show you some examples of how we validate our model. Uh, briefly discuss some of the major limitations of the model, because it's always good to know where the limits are if you apply a model. But then at the end, show you uh, a variety of applications of the Martini model. Okay, so where is this Martini model to be found in the spectrum of uh, uh, multi-scale modeling? Actually, the Martini model is a coarse grain model which allows you to, to bridge the all atom to the continuum scale. Yeah, so if you want to have full atomistic or even quantum level of interactions, you're at this end of the scale where you can maybe simulate for nanoseconds and look at system sizes of uh, tens of nanometers. But eventually, if you want to bridge to a scale, say a full cell, of course, you have to increase both the length and the time scales of your simulation. And by coarse graining, yeah, by, by replacing all your atoms by, or groups of atoms by coarse grain beads, you can, of course, achieve this kind of speed up that allows you, at least with the Martini model, to access really the millisecond time scale and the micrometer length scales. So the idea is uh, of, of the Martini model, the way it has been parameterized is in a very hierarchical uh, systematic fashion, starting from small building blocks, small molecules for which there's a lot of experimental data available uh, and for which you also can run uh, fine-grained or atom simulations that can be used to construct uh, the so-called building blocks and they can then be tied together to form simple systems. Again, for these simple systems, you have access to atomistic simulations and you can use uh, additional experimental data to uh, validate the model. And then eventually you can use this to model the complex systems uh, that you cannot use the all atom models because simply the systems are too big or the time scales too long. Using back mapping, you still would have access to the uh, fully atomistic details if required. But this is the hierarchical approach that we use to model uh, or to build the Martini model. Okay, let's have a look at the, the, the way the model has been uh, 
uh, constructed, um, it uses this, this building block approach. So we realize that there is simple chemical units that you can find irrespective of whether they're part of a lipid or a peptide or an alkane. So in this case, we have units of four methylene groups. Uh, and those are then represented by a single coarse grain bead in the Martini model. So the Martini model reduces the complexity of these molecules and considers groups of atoms as building blocks. And from these building blocks, uh, molecules are then being formed, like you can build uh, Lego houses from Lego bricks. So on average, at the Martini level, we have four heavy atoms plus the associated hydrogens that are united into these efficient or effective coarse-grained beads. Of course, you need different types of uh, building blocks, different type of these coarse-grained beads, because yeah, depending on the chemical nature of the groups that you represent, they can be very apolar, uh, but they can also be very polar or even charged. So the Martini model considers these 18 different building blocks ranging from the very apolar ones denoted by a prefactor of C, and then one to five is a subdivision where level one is the most apolar building block and five is the more uh, or less apolar one. Then there's intermediate polarity building blocks. And then again, the polar blocks range from one to five, P5 being the most polar non-charged building block in uh, Martini. The intermediate ones, they come in different flavors depending on whether they can be hydrogen bond donor uh, with a subscript uh, D or acceptor type. So if you have a group that can be a hydrogen bond donor, you will have slightly different interactions and especially enhanced interactions with groups that can have acceptor qualities. The same is true for the charged uh, groups. They also have donor or donor and acceptor capabilities, but on top of that, they also carry uh, positive or negative charges. So uh, as a, taking a lipid as an example, we see how different type of building blocks can be uh, placed on top of this structure to capture the overall polarity of the, of the lipid molecule. So we have the hydrophobic tails uh, represented by the most hydrophobic particles in Martini C1. Then the glycerol uh, linkage of the lipid is uh, modeled by Na particles because they can also uh, uh, accept hydrogen bonds. And then the switzerlandic head group in this case is represented by two uh, charged particles. So these non-bonded interactions between the building blocks, these are of course key in the Martini model, are parameterized based on reproducing experimental thermodynamic data. And I will show you in a minute uh, how exactly this is done. In addition to these non-bonded interactions, of course, we have to keep molecules together by a set of bonded interactions, uh, much like you do in uh, atomistic simulations. And these are uh, parameterized mainly uh, based on reference atomistic simulations so that we can match the conformation sampled at the coarse grain level to the ones at the, uh, at the Martini level. So uh, having constructed a lipid molecule, of course, then there is a, a long set of validation experiments that need to be uh, uh, performed to see whether the model actually is, uh, uh, is uh, accurate and, and realistic. So what you can do, for instance, in this case, is uh, have these lipids self-assemble, self and indeed you see they form a nice lipid bilayer uh, that you can also then uh, calculate various properties and then see how well they match uh, experimental data. And I will also show an example of that in a couple of slides. Um, so this is in a, in a nutshell how the Martini model uh, looks like and how is this uh, being set up. Uh, so originally, uh, this was developed for lipids, but now this model has been extended to encompass actually all major classes of uh, biomolecules, like proteins, sugars, nucleotides, but also extended to other non-biomolecules, including many types of polymers and other types of nanoparticles, like fullerenes. Of note is also the, the water models that are uh, associated to the Martini model. The standard water model is a 
Leonard Jones bead that actually represents four real water molecules, yeah, similar to the four to one mapping uh, that is the basis of uh, Martini. And we also have a polarizable version that can also uh, screen the electrostatic interactions uh, if needed. So the key features of this Martini model are summarized here. So there is uh, still chemical specificity, which means that you can really distinguish between different lipid tails, for instance, or different amino acids, different nucleotides. Yeah, there's enough chemical specificity that we uh, retain that capability. Of course, the reason for doing a Martini simulation is, is the main reason is that it has an enormous speed up compared to all atom simulations, about three orders of magnitude. Then this uh, building block approach also ensures that the model is very compatible and versatile. So you can easily combine all these different uh, biomolecules as well as non-biomolecules together in one simulation because all the interactions have been calibrated in the same way. And it's easy to extend this to include novel type of molecules that you want to uh, simulate. So the parameterization, as I already said, is a combination of top-down approach where we use experimental data, in particular thermodynamic data, to calibrate uh, in particular the non-bonded interactions, as well as uh, a bottom-up approach where we rely on uh, atomistic simulations, small-scale simulations, uh, mainly used to uh, calibrate our bonded interactions. You can summarize this as a top-up approach. Okay, so what about this name actually? People wonder, Martini, known as the cocktail. Well, in fact, the Martini force field is named after Saint Martin, which is a patron saint of the city of Groningen. And Groningen is the city that I'm, I was born in this city and I'm still living in this city. I'm working at the University of Groningen, so I'm very fond of the city of Groningen. And Saint Martin was a patron saint of this, uh, of this city. So you will see many buildings uh, in the city that are named after Martini. Yeah, there's our famous Martini Tower. And this is why I thought Martini was a a nice name to honor the city of Groningen, but I must admit I also quite like to drink this cocktail. Okay, let's have a further look at the, how the Martini model uh, interactions are actually uh, working. So the non-bonded interactions are based on the, the standard interactions that you also find in atomistic simulations, namely a Coulomb electrostatic interactions for uh, particles that carry uh, full charge, and we have to we have to note that the Coulomb interactions are screened uh, by an electric dielectric constant of 15. Uh, if you use the standard uh, Martini water model, because that of course cannot perform uh, screening by itself. And then all the other non-bonded interactions are described by a Leonard Jones uh, type potential to uh, mimic the dispersion and and overlap repulsion uh, forces between atoms or groups of atoms in this case. Uh, it's also important to realize that all the potentials are short range, so we use a cutoff of 1.1 nanometer in this model, which means that beads see two to three neighboring beads, and after that uh, the uh, potentials and forces are uh, uh, switched off and vanish at the cutoff. This means also that in terms of Coulombic screening, actually at the cutoff, the effective dielectric constant is infinite. So we have a kind of a effectively distance, di distant dependent uh, screening of your Coulomb interactions. All right, so the leonard jones interactions actually depend on the hydrophilic nature of the beads. So the type of leonard jones interactions that we consider between the bead types uh, come at different levels, where level zero is the strongest interaction. So there is a large uh, well, Leonard Jones well, so particles that interact through this level like to sit next to each other, whereas the weakest interaction is uh, a level eight, where the Leonard Jones attraction is much uh, smaller. And then there is one special uh, type of interaction. So these levels are characterized with well, well depths between two and 5.6 kilojoules per mole. And they all, all the beads have the same size. This is for simplicity. Uh, the exception is this, this 10th level that is mainly used to, to uh, increase the repulsion of charged beads and fully apolar beads. 
what is also important is that all the cross interactions between the beads in Martini are explicitly parameterized. So there's no combination rule uh, as is usually done in atomistic uh, models. So here we can see the full interaction matrix uh, between all the 18 B types. So here you have the charged ones, the polar ones, intermediate ones and apolar beads. And the, the Roman letter denotes the, the strength of the interaction. Now to, to guide you a little bit through this table, uh, let's focus first on the, the P4 interactions with all the other beads. Uh, P4 is actually the, the, the bead type that we use to uh, model water. And you see that the strongest interaction of water are with the charged beads. And of course, you can, uh, uh, it, it makes, makes sense that charged beads uh, like to be surrounded by uh, water beads. So this is a strong interaction. And then as you go down the list of polarity, the, the, the interaction level uh, with water uh, becomes less and less. And especially the apolar parts only very weakly interact. So, and this gives then rise to the segregation of oil and water. Uh, so that mimics the uh, hydrophobic driving force of the separation between polar and apolar beads. You can also look, have a look at the, the self interaction level, which also gradually decreases if you go from the polar uh, substances, the polar beads to the more apolar beads. Uh, usually polar beads, they pack at higher density. They have a stronger self interaction. Uh, stronger solvation energies than the apolar beads. So that is all mimicked by using these uh, Leonard-Jones interactions. Of course, there's many more numbers here and they have been mainly uh, optimized by looking at partitioning data. And this is explained in this slide. So what we have done to calibrate all these non-bonded interactions is we've looked at how different B types partition between different types of solvents. So in this case, we look at uh, simulation box full of water beads and octanol beads and we just simply count where polar beads or intermediate beads or apolar beads of all the different flavors are partitioning and from the ratio of the densities in the two phases you can then get uh, directly uh, free energy partitioning or transfer free energy and for this there's a lot of experimental data that can be used to actually uh, compare and to uh, to fine tune the interaction so that you get correct partitioning of the different B types between a large variety of different solvents. So, and using this approach, you can then construct what we call the Martini Bible, which maps B types, which you see in this left column, to certain chemical building blocks. And here you will see then how the partitioning free energy of these building blocks compares to experimental data uh, of these uh, chemical compounds. And if we focus, for instance, on the partitioning free energies between hexadecane and water, you see that we get a very nice match of these B types between experimental data that are available for these compounds and the calibrated coarse grained uh, interactions. Okay, um, of course, there's always things that immediately are clear are not going to be working using this approach. And one thing we realized very early in, in developing the Martini model is that the four to one mapping is actually inadequate to represent rings. So a benzene ring, as shown here on the right, uh, has six heavy atoms. And yeah, so you, with a four to one mapping, you either have one and a half beats, which is a bit awkward, so you could have one bead, but then of course you totally miss the ring geometry. So what we do there is we map it actually to three beads uh, and we call them S beads. So there we use a somewhat smaller bead that has a reduced sigma, so a reduced size, but also reduced interactions with all the other beads. And this has been again calibrated uh, based on densities and partitioning free energies for for instance, benzene and cyclohexane. There's also in a later version of Martini uh, that was used to, to model uh, nucleo nucleotides, uh, there's a class of even tinier beads that are introduced to the model that allow the correct stacking distances of uh, planar compounds. So these are then called T beads, but these are somewhat specialized beads. 
So we have the normal beats, N beats, that follow the, the, the normal rules, then these small beats, the S beats, that are somewhat reduced, and then specific beats for specific cases, T beats. Okay, then something about the, the bonded interactions uh, that we use. Again, there we use the standard type of bonded potentials that you can also find in any uh, atomistic model. Uh, so we have uh, uh, bond stretching, bond vibrations, angle vibrations, and dihedrals to control the overall conformations of uh, the Martini molecules. So the way they are being calibrated, as said, here we use uh, mostly uh, reference or atom simulations. So you can run an atomistic model of a small compound that you want to parameterize in Martini. And for instance, in this case, you can look at the effective angle distribution that is sampled atomistically and then calibrate your angle potential at the coarse grain level such that you get distributions that are overlapping as well as possible. And this is usually done in an iterative way. So you start with a certain angle potential and then you modify that in a couple of steps so you get the overlapping distributions as, as well as possible. Okay, then for, for proteins, actually, the, the situation is a little bit more complex because here we usually also need uh, additional bonded potentials to constrain the overall secondary structure of proteins. Because one key limitation of Martini is, of course, that directionality of hydrogen bonds is lacking because we average on uh, uh, small groups into effective uh, coarse grain beads, so the, the uh, directional hydrogen bonds are only treated in an isotropic way. And if you, for instance, look at an alpha helix of a peptide, then there is in reality a lot of directionality, uh, directional hydrogen bonds that keep the secondary structure stable. So in Martini, we, we mimic this by introducing certain angles or dihedrals that kind of uh, fix this secondary structure. So the secondary structure in this case is an input uh, into the simulation and cannot uh, change during the simulation. We have uh, a script called Martinize that actually can generate these topologies for you. So that's all very easy. You have, just have to provide an atomistic input structure and then you get out the, the protein topology and structures at the uh, Martini level. To construct larger proteins, actually, there is something else that we usually need to stabilize the, the, the global uh, fold of a protein. And this is uh, done using an elastic network approach. Uh, one of these approaches is termed Elnadin, which basically defines additional harmonic potentials between uh, all uh, C alpha beats within a certain cutoff. So this is illustrated in this little uh, rocking image where you can see additional bonds being added between coarse grain beads to stabilize the overall fold. Of course, you're free to cut away bonds again to allow certain uh, domain motions in your protein. Uh, but this is the way that, that Martini proteins are kept uh, stable and, and close to their native or whatever other state you're interested in. Again, this is needed because the directionality of hydrogen bonds uh, is missing in Martini. We use a similar approach, in fact, for uh, stabilizing double-stranded DNA or uh, RNA. Okay, a few words on why Martini is actually so fast. Uh, as I said, three orders of magnitude speed up, typically. Of course, one reason is that there is less particles, so there is uh, fewer interactions to, uh, to compute. Um, then we use only uh, short range potentials, which also uh, makes it uh, much faster. Uh, then there is less friction, uh, and this also leads to faster sampling. So you miss atomistic degrees of freedom, so the energy surface is much smoother. So this allows you to do a faster sampling of your, free, uh, of your potential energy surface. And then on top of this, you can also use time steps that are typically an order of magnitude larger than uh, what is commonly used in all atom models. Uh, one reason actually for being able to use accurate or to use larger time steps is that a very accurate sample sampling is less critical. And what I mean by that is uh, illustrated in the 
uh, energy landscape uh, below. So suppose in reality, the energy landscape looks something like this. Then if you have a very accurate all atom model, it should follow reality uh, quite closely. And then of course, you also would like to sample this landscape as closely as possible because all the details are actually realistic. At the coarse grain level, actually you simplify this overall energy landscape. Eh? You remove all these little bumps, all this friction from individual atomistic degrees of freedom are integrated out. So the energy landscape is already much smoother to begin with. And then the sampling can be done with larger time steps because you want to capture the overall shape of the energy landscape and not so much the very uh, tiny nitty details. Okay, an overview of uh, the Martini versions that have been developed over the years. Um, the first version was actually an internal version uh, developed uh, around 2000, starting with only four particle types and four interaction levels, originally uh, for lipids only. Then the first uh, public release was Martini 1.4, uh, which was an improved version of this uh, initial one, still only uh, for lipids. Then in 2007, the, uh, the larger uh, number of particles was introduced. So this is the, the current standard Martini model that I have just been talking about, featuring 18 particle types, 10 interaction levels. Uh, originally also uh, still uh, for lipids only, but then this was uh, soon after extended to proteins, uh, in the Martini 2.1 version, uh, again, redefining some of the, uh, the basic interactions. Uh, then in 2013, actually, there was a Martini 2.2 version, which was again an improved version of Martini 2.1, uh, particularly for proteins, and also a 2.2p version that is a polarized version of Martini 2.2, where some of the side chains also now feature uh, internal charge beads that give it some uh, polarization uh, effects. Then in 2015, there's actually also an uh, uh, implicit solvent version uh, introduced. Uh, so far, this works nicely for lipids, but not yet uh, for proteins. And then we're all eagerly waiting for the uh, 2018 release of Martini 3, which is uh, about to be released, uh, expected release date yesterday. It, it should have been released already, but as these things go, they always require more testing, last minute testing. Uh, and and we're, so, we're hopefully releasing that very soon. Mm. So it will have even more particle types, yeah, more possibilities, more particle types. Also more interaction levels, so more fine tuning has been done. Uh, so some more interaction levels have been introduced. But the major thing has been a recalibration of these normal, small, and tiny particle interactions. So they're much better calibrated in this new force field. One of the major advantages is also that the, the, the stickiness of, of Martini proteins, this is something that uh, we and others have noticed, that proteins have a too high tendency to stick together uh, in Martini 2 versions, uh, has now been uh, reduced and largely resolved. So the little movie here uh, shows you actually what we now can do with Martini 3, for instance, is to mix different resolutions. So we have here uh, a simulation of a liquid dodecane uh, at three levels of resolutions. Either dodecane is represented by three normal beads in orange, by four S beads in red, or six T beads in magenta. And as you saw, the whole thing nicely remains completely mixed. Okay, that was a quick glimpse of Martini 3. Uh, something else that is interesting uh, is a whole range of high throughput tools that are also available, like the Insane protocol, where you can quickly set up complex membrane systems, a similar protocol, but now within the Charm GUI framework uh, called Martini Maker. There's the backward script that you can use to, to backward or to, to transform from coarse grained or supra coarse grained to coarse grained and fully atomistic models in a very efficient way. There is the DAFT protocol that can be used to sample protein-protein interactions uh, in a high throughput fashion, fashion. And there's also uh, an automatic topology builder that has been uh, developed by Burrow and Kramer. 
that can be used for a quick initial guess of uh, making topologies also in a high uh, throughput version. Um, so these are all very useful tools and more and more tools are being developed, not only by us, but also by other, many other uh, Martini users around the world. Okay, then now I want to quickly, uh, quickly go over a few uh, examples of how we validate the models that we make. So again, this is comparing Martini to experimental data in case of uh, properties of lipid membranes. So we see, for instance, that structural properties like the area per lipid for different lipid types are very well reproduced, but also elastic properties like bending rigidity or area compressibility are in the right uh, order of magnitude. Thermodynamic properties like phase transition temperatures or the line tension, the tension it, uh, you need to, to build a membrane edge, for instance, are all semi-quantitatively uh, reproduced. And the same is true for dynamical quantities, although usually we're happy there with order of magnitude uh, correspondence. Uh, another important type of characterization is, is looking at uh, lipid phase behavior. So what we can do is actually we mix, for instance, saturated and unsaturated lipids that experimentally are known to separate into liquid ordered and liquid disordered phases. Um, and we can mimic that uh, in our Martini simulations. So you saw in the movie that starting from a completely random mix of these two type of lipids together with cholesterol, they separate into a liquid order and a liquid disorder domain uh, in perfect agreement with uh, the experimental uh, measurements. Another uh, example of validation is in this case, uh, comparing to uh, all atom data uh, performed in the lab of Telemann for the partitioning of amino acid sidechain analogs across lipid bilayers. So here you see the free energy profile of dragging a leucine from the water phase across the bilayer interface into the middle of the uh, core of the bilayer. And you see in this case, because leucine is a hydrophobic sidechain, it likes to sit in the, in the membrane, but there's a large or small, well, a reasonably small barrier for actually entering it. And you see that the coarse grain model captures this behavior uh, quite accurately. Uh, the same you can do for, for other uh, amino acids. And of course, we looked at all 20 possible amino acids. So here's the example of serine, which is a, a slightly hydrophilic uh, amino acid. And you see indeed, there's a increase by for about 20 kilojoules per mole by partitioning from the water phase into the core of the bilayer. For glutamate, charge one, the increase is even larger. And there you see that we actually missing some of this interaction uh, at the coarse grain level, but provided uh, the, 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 the uh, charged residue you will actually never find inside the bilayer. So the first part is actually the more relevant part. And this is quite well captured at the Martini level. And here's another example where you see how for uh, aromatic residue, also globally we capture the, the same profile as seen atomistically, although there's certainly still some room for improvement uh, in this particular case. Another uh, validation example, again, uh, looking at uh, coarse grain simulations um, and comparing this to atomistic data. So what we see here is actually a phospholipase binding to a lipid membrane interface only shown by the, by the head groups. And here cation pi interactions are actually important. So the interactions between the, the coline head groups of the, of the, of the lipid bilayer and these uh, uh, ring, uh, the aromatic side chains is, uh, is important. And this is one of the features of the new Martini 3 model. So this was a Martini 3 simulation. And you see, if you look at the overall binding profile, uh, the depth of the anchoring of the residues uh, and comparing all atom data to the Martini 3, we see that we can capture the way the protein embeds itself inside the membrane uh, very accurately. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, this is an example where we validated how uh, well Martini could capture structural changes in protein. In protein. So remember that the secondary structure in principle is fixed, 
But in this case, we have uh, a mecha mechanosensitive channel that co is uh, consisting of separate uh, helices, uh, transmembrane helices that can move independently from each other. So each of these five, it's a pentameric channel, so each of these five helices uh, has its own elastic network, but they can move independently from each other. And so what is known experimentally is that if you put a membrane under tension, this channel actually starts opening. And this we can mimic at the Martini level by putting tension on the membrane. And then the movie shows indeed that the channel opens under this tension and you see blue beads, coarse grain water beads now being able to escape from one side of the membrane through the other. So this is another example of validation where we know that the protein should open under tension and we can mimic this process uh, quite realistically. Okay, um, here we have another example of validation. In this case, we're looking at cytochrome PC1, which is a respiratory chain complex that you find in mitochondrial membranes. So we uh, set this complex up inside a membrane containing special lipids, cardiolipins, that you find in mitochondrial membranes. And here you see a, a top view of this, this whole complex. It's a dimer complex. And here we're going to look at how these cardiolipins diffuse in the membrane and are able to bind to this complex, but also in particular that they can bind to sites that are identified as uh, binding sites on, in the crystal structure. So these cavities, they apparently uh, uh, like to bind cardiolipin. And in the simulation, we can actually see this happening. We see a gatekeeper that moves out of the way, and then eventually cardiolipin molecules are able to spontaneously bind to both of these cavities in perfect correspondence to the uh, uh, experimental crystal structure. So this is again an example of validation of our Martini model. Okay, so now I want to spend a couple of slides on uh, some limitations of our model. And one of the limitations has to do with the semi-quantitative nature of the model, uh, which is also called the fuzziness of the model. So suppose that you want to model uh, a DMPC lipid, which is a typical lipid, which has 14 carbons in its tail, then you immediately have a problem. Of course, you can use this 12 carbon tail, which has three beads in its tail, or you could resort to one tail bead more, but then actually you're representing a DPPC uh, lipid. But yeah, so what do you do in this case? Well, you can look at some properties, so you can say, okay, uh, look, let's have, have a look at the bilayer thickness. Experimentally for DMPC, it's 4.3. It's actually quite close to the three-beat Martini model. But then if you look at the melting temperature, the, the gel to liquid melting temperature, then actually the four-beat model is closer. So then again, what do you do? So the solution is actually that there is, uh, there's no escape here, so you have to depending on what you want. So if you're after structural data, you probably go for the three-beat model. And if you want to have the thermodynamic data more correct, you might use the four-beat model uh, in this uh, particular case. But you can use it to your advantage. Yeah? So you can uh, say that you wrote in the paper that your DPPC bilayer melts at 295 Kelvin. And then the referee says, oh, that's, that's 20, 20 Kelvin too low. That's not good. And then you say, oh, but sorry, I actually meant I, I modeled the MPC. And then the referee immediately would say, ah, but then, then it's fine because then it's spot on and I'm happy to accept your publication. Okay, another uh, limitation that I already uh, uh, discussed a little bit is that we have uh, the directionality of hydrogen bolts missing and therefore secondary structure of proteins and, and, and nucleotides is, is being fixed. We use this with, uh, or we do this using elastic networks. Uh, and therefore, uh, one, one major limitation is that protein folding, for instance, cannot be simulated. There is a potential solution that has been recently introduced by uh, uh, Paul Maciepak and Theodorakis. Uh, that is using a, a Go Martini type of network. So instead of a 
fully elastic network, they use go-type potentials that are also allowed to dissociate, and therefore you can mimic uh, the, the actually folding of, of proteins using these type of uh, elastic networks. So that's a promising way to maybe get more structural flexibility into uh, the Martini model. Uh, another limitation is that the friction is missing, or that is an advantage because that uh, allows you to do much faster sampling. But that means also that the time scale should be interpreted with uh, care, yeah, because all this, this friction of all the small atomistic details is missing, so your kinetics will be artificially enhanced. Uh, usually we find a, a speed up of about two to eight or ten, uh, depending on, on, the, on the system details. Uh, but also the, in complex processes, of course, the kinetics might be uh, differ more because there it depends mainly on the, the barriers between states. But this is also true for atomistic models. So in general, you have to be careful by interpreting uh, the kinetics. So time scales should be interpreted with care. Uh, a solution is, of course, to apply friction to the equation of motion. And, uh, you can do this differently for different degrees of freedom. Of course, you would then uh, also uh, uh, lose a lot of the speed up of the model. So in principle, this is uh, not recommended, I think. But you can potentially do that. Another limitation that is inherent of any coarse grain model is the fact that you're losing degrees of freedom and that you're replacing some entropy by enthalpic terms. So you can see this, for instance, here, if we look at the uh, conformational entropy of a lipid molecule uh, over time, uh, lipid in a, in a bilayer, you can uh, estimate the uh, conformational entropy through this uh, Schlitter equation. So in a fully atomistic model, it builds up to uh, this level. And if you do it at the coarse grain level, you see the entropy is much lower, precisely because you're missing some of the uh, degrees of freedom. Of course, if you compare to a fully estimated atomistic simulation that has been mapped uh, afterwards to its coarse grain representation, then you see the build-up is much more similar. So, uh, but it's important that you realize that some of the entropy has been uh, replaced by entropic terms in this model, which means that in principle, the temperature dependency of the model is, uh, is wrong. And also in general, the driving forces can be, uh, can be wrong. Um, recalibration of the parameters for specific temperatures is one way, but it's not a very pragmatic way. So uh, typically one should interpret also the driving forces that you get out of Martini uh, with care. Another limitation is the screening of, uh, of uh, the, the implicit screening that we have in the Martini model. Which means, for instance, that uh, the coarse grain model interactions are screened by a relative epsilon of 15, independent of the environment. So whether charges are in oil or in water, they are screened by uh, the electric constant of 15. Fortunately, mostly they are in water. So this is then uh, realistic, given the effective distant dependency of the screening in Martini. But of course, in reality, as you capture in all atom simulations, you have a difference in screening if you go from a aqueous medium to an apolar medium. There is a way to actually uh, reproduce or to, to capture this also in Martini. And this is by using a polarizable model. So we have a polarizable water model where you have two charge beads uh, added to the central Leonard Jones bead. They can rotate and they can kind of mimic the orientational polarizability of uh, the four water molecules to which the coarse grain bead is uh, being mapped. So using this polarizable water model and also together with PME, you can uh, increase the uh, accuracy of your charged interactions. Okay, then the last uh, couple of uh, minutes, I would like to uh, present some of the uh, Martini applications. And I think these show you where the real strength of the Martini model lies. So one is in uh, brute force sampling. So really you can attain uh, long, very long time scales, and you can observe processes happening spontaneously. So in this case, we're looking at cyclodextrin, which is an oligosaccharide. Oh, sorry, the presentation is 
interrupted so let's go back to where we were so cyclodextrin is a oligosaccharide that can actually extract cholesterol from a lipid membrane mm -hmm. so this is shown here yeah the movie works again so here you can see that uh, we initially have cyclodextrin surrounding a small liposome which in this case is phase separated into these liquid ordered and liquid disordered domains there's cholesterol uh, everywhere and the key question now is is this cyclodextrin being able to extract cholesterol and also does it do so from the disordered or the ordered domains and we see that in the simulation spontaneously this, uh, the cyclodextrin binds to the surface and extracts cholesterol mainly from the disordered domains another example a recent example of where brute force long time scales uh, can be reached is in the photosystems uh, 2 complex where we looked at the exchange of uh, electron carriers so here we looked at this beast of a complex the photosystem 2 that you find in the uh, and the trilocoid membrane that is involved in the light harvesting process and the key player are these uh, plastokinone molecules that that should be able to bind to the photosystem to uh, complex in their oxidized form and then if they reach their binding site and this you can see is happening in this simulation so it finds the entrance to the the binding site the binding site is uh, over here and there's actually or our simulations predict that there's three possible channels by which this uh, electron carrier can enter this uh, photosystem two complex so eventually it enters and finds its binding spot there it's, it's uh, stably bound in this uh, oxidized state and then if you would do a few quantum calculation you can simulate actually the uh, chemical process that is taking place but here we simply change the topologies to represent now the reduced version the plastokinol and there we see that the plastokinol as you expect it to do immediately unbinds and uh, leaves the complex to deliver the electrons to the next uh, player in this uh, electron chain so that was another example of uh, brute force simulation then of course you can also use martini to go big bigger and biggest and the current record is a paper that is uh, recently published on the archive from the humor lab by Vögele at uh, Altres, where they now have looked at, at membrane patches up to uh, more than 100 million beads, uh, really connecting uh, the, the, the molecular scale to continuum levels. So they looked at the diffusion constant as a function of uh, the finite size effects of the, the uh, simulation box, and they eventually bridge really towards the continuum scale. So more than 100 million beats is corresponding actually to 1 billion atoms. So these are really giant type of simulations that are now within reach. You can do this uh, with Martini. Another uh, major application of Martini is that you can increase the complexity of your systems quite easily because of this building block principle. You can quite easily extend your library of molecules. And in this case, we looked at plasma membrane models that consist of more than 60 different lipid types uh, differing in lipid head groups also different in lipid tails and then setting it up in a completely asymmetric fashion uh, the way that real plasma membranes are uh, modeled or are, uh, are uh, existing and then you can do uh, interesting analysis, uh, analysis on for instance the cholesterol density fluctuations that you find in these complex mixtures this is actually ongoing research. We're currently not sure yet what we're looking at here, whether these are random fluctuations or critical fluctuations or maybe micro emulsions and how this all connects to the idea that rafts are forming in uh, real plasma membrane uh, systems. So increasing complexity. Uh, the next step, the current step we're doing is, is then embedding also proteins into these uh, complex membrane mixtures. So to at another level of complexity you can look at uh, protein lipid interactions you can see what kind of lipids are enriched around these proteins and again this is a very 
fascinating ongoing research, uh, ultimately leading to, to really fully complex models of plasma membranes, not only having all these lipid types, but also hundreds of different proteins that are embedded in these, uh, these mixtures. So this is currently running on our uh, computer clusters. Another uh, thing you can easily do with Martini is uh, really high throughput uh, studies. So here's an example where high throughput Martini simulations were actually used to predict possible peptides that can form uh, nanofibers, stable hydrogels. So short peptides can form these kind of, uh, they can self-aggregate. But yeah, there's of course already at the tripeptide level, there's, there's 8,000 possible peptides that could be synthesized. And if you go to tetrapeptides, there's even many more. So work by Fredericks actually a couple of years ago, uh, they simply uh, generated Martini models for all possible tripeptides and then predicted which ones would be potentially good hydrogel formers. And then to do that, they looked at the hydrophobicity on the one hand of these tripeptides and then doing short scale simulations, looked at their aggregation propensity. And then they were identifying peptides that were uh, aggregating quite strongly, but still are on the, on the low or, or on the more polar side eh, because the more hydrophobic peptides, of course, all self-assemble. Uh, sorry, here are the hydrophobic peptides. They're all self-assemble, but they don't form these hydrogels. But the more polar ones uh, can potentially form these hydrogels. And based on these simulations, they actually predicted, in this case, a KYF uh, peptide that indeed formed a very beautiful hydrogels. And here in the simulation, you can see also how these peptides self-assemble into these kind of uh, soluble fibers. Okay, another example where uh, I think Martini is, uh, is strong is that you can combine different types of molecules together. So here's an example where we combine polymers and lipid models together because these specific polymers uh, are called uh, steric maleic acid copolymers are uh, actually uh, used to solubilize small membrane patches into nanodisks. And they can be used to extract proteins, membrane proteins with their surrounding lipids directly from uh, real cell membranes. But how this process exactly uh, happens at the molecular scale is not, uh, not clear. So we can simulate this at the Martini level. So here you see a movie showing how these peptides have a high tendency to absorb on the membrane and form these kind of small water defects while translocating. And these water defects then grow actually into larger and larger pores and completely destabilize the membrane. So at this point, the periodic boundary conditions uh, still uh, keep the membrane uh, together, but you can also do a self-assembly simulation and then you can show that these peptides together with these polymers indeed form these kind of uh, Nano disks. Another example where we go away from biomolecules uh, here is uh, we actually modeling bulk heterojunction morphologies. So these are mixtures of fullerenes and, and polymers that are used in uh, organic solar cells, organic photovoltaics. Uh, so we construct Martini models of these polymers and acceptor molecules. And then what we do is actually mimicking uh, the way experimentally these devices are made. There are, uh, these, these compounds are dissolved in, in, in solvents like chlorobenzene and then drop cast and, and spun. So you get a, a nice film and then after drying the solvent out, you eventually end up with a, uh, this, this uh, bulk heterojunction uh, morphology. So this process is mimicked here at the, uh, Martini level, so we started with a large box with, uh, containing a lot of solvent and then step by step took away the solvent to end up with this uh, final morphology. And then you can actually compare this morphology to experimentally uh, measured morphologies using electron microscopy images. And you see we can capture these uh, morphologies uh, quite well. But of course, now we have access to the details, the molecular details of how the interfaces are formed 
But using back mapping tools, we can actually fully reconstitute the atomistic details and then use that, for instance, for the quantum chemical calculations of the actually uh, uh, exciton uh, formation and, and splitting of the exciton into the, the charges. Okay, the final uh, applications that I want to show before uh, the, uh, the webinar will end is uh, some new opportunities that arise from the uh, Martini 3 model. So there's uh, now the ability to look at a specific liquid-liquid coexistence of, in this case, uh, ionic liquid and fish oil system, where we see that, oh, this is the wrong movie that is showing. Okay, this is a system showing uh, formation of coacervates, where actually you see that if you have mixtures of polylysins and polyglutamides or charged polymers in general, under certain conditions, they can segregate into two liquid phases, one enriched in these polymers and one depleted in these polymers. And this actually uh, works now with the Martini 3 model quite well. And the other system that I wanted to show is this uh, ionic liquid fish oil binary system. So we have fish oil containing some of the polyunsaturated oil that is preferentially extracted, being extracted by this particular ionic liquid. So again, Martini 3 allows you to, to realistically simulate uh, these kind of systems as well. Okay, and then the final application, also a Martini 3 application, where we're looking at a little benzene molecule that is able to find spontaneously its binding pocket in a T4 lysozyme mutant, uh, where actually there is a pre-pocket as well as the binding pocket, and eventually the benzene molecule that you still see happily sampling, sampling the aqueous phase. So there's one benzene molecule in this simulation. So it uh, takes some time before it finally discovers that there's actually a nice place for it to hide away from the solvent into the protein. And here it actually binds to the pre-pocket, which is close to the final binding, po binding pocket. But eventually it discovers this final binding pocket where it still has to compete, compete with a tyrosine molecule that also likes to sit in this pocket from time to time. So you will see this tyrosine now trying to kick out this benzene again and taking the binding site right here. But then the benzene fights back and say, look, I'm the more apolar guy here. So this is my place. So this is an example that opens up, I think, also high throughput uh, drug screening uh, in protein ligand binding. All right. Let me conclude. I've shown you that the Martini force field uses a building block principle based on the four to one mapping scheme. And parameterization uses both experimental top down and all atom bottom up reference data. I've shown you a few examples of the Martini validation against a large variety of systems. Again, either using experimental data or higher resolution models. Um, I've shown you that Martini is able to sample face paint efficiently, but of course, at the cost of a reduced accuracy, I used to call, or I tend to call this semi-quantitative. And of course, there are certain limitations with respect to, for instance, protein folding. And then at the end, I show you that Martini can indeed be used by many, for many types of applications involving both biomolecules and non-biological ones. Uh, excelling in applications requiring either big systems or long time scales, as well as high throughput uh, systems and systems requiring a large complexity. So with that, I acknowledge people in the group. So the current group members that all contribute to the ongoing development are listed here. There's a group of key international collaborators, uh, Peter Tillemann, Duca Mutacelli, Helgi Ingolfsson, Manon. Melo and Xavier Perio that I'd like to acknowledge. And I'd also like to acknowledge the large international Martini community that contributes with their testing and coming up with new models and applications all the time. That is very much appreciated. So with that, I think uh, I give the screen back. Or no, I keep the screen, I think, but I think the session is now open for questions.
questions and answers. Yes. Thank you, Sebastian, for the great presentation. And uh, everyone, if you have any questions, please use the questions panel. Uh, could you please, the, the, Sebastian, could you please give the, the slide? Yes. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you can use the questions panel to type in your questions, and I'll give you the microphone to ask it, or I will ask it on your behalf. Uh, I have one question. So Martini is also being tried in multi-scale hybrid mode, right? How well is it working? Is it possible to mix with uh, atomistic or maybe on different scales? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We do have some multi-scale models where you can directly combine Martini and atomistic force fields in one simulation. These so-called hybrid simulations. This can all either be done in a static way where you have a certain predefined area in full atomistic detail surrounded by coarse grain beads, much like in the QMMM approach, or this can be done in an adaptive resolution uh, way where, where coarse grain molecules, if they enter uh, a central zone, uh, also change their resolution. Uh, so this, this works for, for, for uh, so we've demonstrated this in a number of papers that it works for, for uh, certain uh, key systems uh, but the, the problem a little bit is that in the current uh, implementations the speed up that you get is uh, still very limited so at the end you could as well run the system fully atomistically so this still requires some optimization of the way that these uh, algorithms are being implemented in the major simulation codes but in principle there's there's ways of combining atomistic and coarse grain models directly Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few questions. Uh, there is one which just says polarizable Martini, question mark. <laughs> so I guess the question is, uh, do you plan to develop a polarizable model? Um, yes, in, in a certain sense we already have some polarizable version of Martini, uh, the Martini 2.2p model features some polarized, the polarizable side chains. Uh, that in combination with the polarizable water model gives you a much more realistic description of the electrostatic interactions. Uh, there's also ongoing efforts to introduce polarizability along the uh, protein backbone that eventually would also allow us maybe to uh, simulate protein folding again in a more realistic uh, way. So there's definitely uh, ongoing efforts to uh, to introduce polarizability into the model but martini 3 is is standard martini 3 will be uh, non polarizable but also there we will have flavors coming up that have polarizability uh, included mm -hmm. thank you uh, next question is from zaine who is asking uh I'd like to know when simulating proteins uh, is it important to use Elnadine force field or can we go get as good results using Martini 2.2? Um, the Elnadine force field, uh, for most proteins we use the Elnadine force field. Uh, smaller peptides like, like single transmembrane helices, you can also stabilize with the appropriate dihedral angles. But for the larger proteins, typically we do uh, use an elastic network, or we're also now exploring more and more this go martini approach, where actually you can also see a partial unfolding of, of the, the protein or peptide involved. Um, what you also can do, so you don't have to constrain, especially for larger protein complexes, you can apply the elastic network only to certain domains, so you can have domains that you want to keep stable, you stabilize with the elastic network, but the motion between domains, you can cut the, elex, uh, the elastic bonds, so then you can have full motion between the domains. And the, the, the example I gave on the, uh, uh, the channel gate opening of this mechanosensitive channel is an example where the individual domains could move with respect to each other and give rise to the opening of the channel. So yeah, this, uh, this gives multiple options of using these elastic network uh, models. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Uh, another question is by Ashtosh Tripathi, who is asking whether it's possible to look at conformation of changes in the protein where there is a change in the secondary structure, for example, partial unwinding or coiling of a helix. Okay, again, this, this, this comes back to the same, same point. So with the standard elastic networks, you cannot do this because then the, the secondary structure is fixed. But again, you can either tweak or cut bones in the elastic network that allows you more flexibility. And then if you can compare this to atomistic simulation, you can try to capture the same type of fluctuations as you see in the reference atomistic simulation. Uh, and this, this Go Martini approach might be a, a way where you can also destabilize uh, the folded conformation and go from unfolded to a certain folded uh, conformation with the Martini model. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, there's another question by Hugh So, who is wondering why the POPC for the OPC pop, uh, for silt has changed between 2.1 and 2.2, and there is uh, one extra, one less atom actually in the new version. Um, the reason is that we found that the the five, the original five bit model for the OPC. Uh, produced bilayers that were way too thick. So yeah, the, the DOPC is a level of, uh, if you count the uh, number of carbon atoms, you could represent it either with a four or a five bead. It's kind of one of these in-between uh, type of lipids. Uh, so more extensive comparison to uh, atomistic simulations and experimental data decided to, uh, to uh, go to the uh, yeah, this somewhat shorter four-beat version that, in our view, performs better than the five-beat one. Mm -hmm. uh, here another question. What happens to cross-grain models developed with Martini 2.2, whether they will reproduce the correct behavior if you start using 3.0 with them? I guess this is tested already. Yeah, so, so we try to, yeah, so with the Martini 3 model, we of course recalibrated the whole interaction matrix. So in principle, the behavior of all systems will be affected. Uh, most of the topologies, so the B-types that are used for, for all the lipids, for instance, and also the protein side chains uh, are not changing, but their interactions will have changed. Um, so we're doing a lot of tests to make sure that the systems that behave well still behave well at the Martini 3 level. But of course, we cannot run every single system that has ever been simulated with Martini. And for sure, whenever you uh, improve on a force field, there will be hopefully in general an improvement, but there will always be systems or areas where you actually will see that the system becomes uh, uh, will not improve or even will become uh, worse. This is unavoidable. Uh, so again, this will have to, we have to see uh, if this is the case also with Martini 3, but we hope that for most systems that behave already well, uh, they will remain behaving well. Mm -hmm. Another question from Matthias Mercado is, uh, how sensitive is Martini to electric fields? I think this was partially covered in the talk. Yes, so electric fields, uh, in principle, there is charges in, in Martini, so everything that bears a charge, uh, ions or head groups of lipids of, or charged amino side chains will respond to an electric field. Of course, their response will be uh, much more uh, realistic if you combine this with a polarizable water model. And so there we have, for instance, shown that with a polarizable water model, you can, for instance, study electroporation of membranes. So if you put an electrostatic field across a membrane, it is known that this creates pores in membranes. And with the Martini polarizable version, you can actually also see that happening in the simulation. So there, in principle, you can uh, play with electrostatic fields and you should see at least qualitatively a correct behavior appearing. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question by Joshua. If Martini 3 can combine TS and NB models in a single simulation, could you use a smaller bit at the end of your NB lipid to distinguish between example 12 and 14 C lipid tails? Uh, yes, that's a good point. So with Martini 3, now we have 
also fully recalibrated and integrated these tiny beats into the model. So that gives you also more uh, ability to fine tune and indeed uh, distinguish between 14 and 16 uh, carbon tails. So indeed, this, this opens up opportunities in that direction. Hmm. Thanks. There's another question whether you would recommend certain software for doing Monte Carlo simulations with uh, Martini. Well, there I don't think I can recommend anything. I've never done any Monte Carlo, so I'm not very familiar with Monte Carlo software. I'm also not sure. I think people have tried to do Monte Carlo on Martini. I mean, I see no reason why Martini should not be able to be uh, sampled using a Monte Carlo algorithm. But uh, yeah, so I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to recommend specific software for that. Yeah, in principle it should. Yeah. Uh, normal, yeah. uh, there is a question which I don't understand completely, but uh, could you give insight in regard to the usage of Martini to study coacervate? Coacervate. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so coacervate, this is uh, one of the last examples I, I showed. So with Martini 3, we have now been looking at uh, coacervate systems uh, very many different conditions. And it seems that we get uh, quite realistic behavior. So indeed we can see this, this phase separation of, of liquids, liquid liquid phase separation where one of the liquids is enriched in these polymers that give rise to uh, these coacervate systems and a region which is depleted. So this is something that we're definitely trying to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to, embark on more and more in the future because there's many interesting questions to be answered because nobody really knows what are the driving forces for these coacervate formation and what is the uh, what what determines what partitions into which of the two phases mm -hmm. so there i think martini can play a nice uh, role thanks and uh, we have a number of questions but one last question because we are already quite over time uh, are there any improvements uh, being made in the representation of ions and their iterations, uh, specifically for calcium ions? Uh, yes, that's also a good point. So standard martini uh, works quite nicely for, for standard ions, sodium chloride, uh, performing an overall screening that uh, these ions do also in reality. But yeah, so far the ion models have been quite crude. Uh, a good model for calcium uh, is indeed not available yet, but with Martini 3, also there, we have much better interactions for ions, including the divalent ions. Uh, so there also we found that uh, uh, using the small or the tiny particles sometimes can also improve the description of these uh, ionic solutions. So yes, you can expect also uh, better ionic parameters uh, with the new forthcoming Martini 3. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and uh, there's still a few questions, but uh, since we're quite ahead of time, uh, I would ask the, our audience to continue maybe using the support forums of uh, Martini that you showed us earlier in the talk. And uh, so could you, yes. So in the next few weeks, uh, our webinar series continue with uh, presentations by uh, two companies, one is from Biki Technologies, which will tell us about finding a trade-off between speed and accuracy during the uh, simulations of protein ligand binding models. And we also have on 10th of May a presentation by uh, Novartis on a, uh, NMR guided docking modeling of protein ligand complexes. So with this, uh, uh, We'll finish today's presentation. I want to thank again Sivertian for the great talk and uh, see you at the next uh, event. Thank you thank for seeing everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.